Good evening, everyone. I'd like to start. I am trying a new contraption so I can keep my hands moving because that's how I talk with my hands. So uh, hopefully this is going to work. So I'm Superintendent Kathleen Smith. Uh, I'm welcoming you to the last uh, community forum of the year. I like to start by uh, telling everybody that when I began the role as Superintendent of Schools back in 2013, one of the things you do to prepare is you do community listening tours so that you can uh, prepare your strategic plan, do your transition into the role. And at the time, I thought they were so powerful. I probably had about six community forums, forums with a number of students in the district, and it really does inform the work that we do every day. So it's something that we've kept going for the past couple of years. So this will be the last one of the 2017-18 school year. Um, also, I would like to, and just in the audience, I want to thank Principal Diane Lynch for hosting us this evening, her associate principal, uh, John Lynch, and again, there's no relation there, the Lynches, and we also have uh, assistant principal, uh, Lisa Thomas, so I want to thank them for the work that they're doing here itself and for hosting us this evening. Uh, we also have our counselor at large, Wynn Farwell. I said, Wynn, you had a night off and you chose to come to the community forum, so he told me I was worth it. I think that's great. And I'm really pleased to have you here. Um, I also have a number of Brockton Public School staff, uh, interns, uh, the very people every day that really have certainly helped us get through what I would consider a very, very difficult year this year. So I want to start out in a very positive way. When I look back, and June 1st is two days around the corner, and I look at what's happening, and probably those of you that have children in the schools are going to many of the end of the year celebrations. Uh, there are concerts, there are plays, there are, you know, you can't find any place around the city that we don't have something going on in a Brockton public school. So when I also look around and see, we just finished our spring musical and I was notified last evening that we have nine nominations for state awards. You know, this is your high school students that come up, they take part, whether it's the drama behind the scenes, whether they're on stage, whether they're in the chorus, it is just amazing the work they do. If anyone had an opportunity the past couple of weeks, and I still think it's at the library, the artwork being shown. Not only was I able to see our teachers and faculty artwork, our art teachers throughout the district, which is also being displayed at the library, if you go down to the children's section, kindergarten through eighth grade is presently there. And you go around and look at the work. I had to do a double take on some of the kindergartners and the work that they actually prepared uh, as artists. And you can just see the talent. And certainly, I, I want to thank the teachers, the parents, all of you that make this such a wonderful thing in our district. Last week, we had a Pops concert at the high school, highlighting uh, our uh, orchestra, um, our jazz ensemble, highlighting our uh, chorus. Um, and this was kind of the last hurrah for a lot of our upperclassmen that will be graduating, close to a thousand of them, uh, this Saturday on the fields of Brockton High. We've had many students receive scholarships. When you listen to the student that got accepted at West Point, the students getting accepted at BC, the students getting accepted at Harvard, getting accepted at many of our University of Massachusetts, Lowell, Dartmouth, very difficult to get into a lot of these universities now. Wasn't that way many years ago, but again, it's um, an excellent bargain. And when I talk about bargain, you're talking now thousands and thousands of dollars for college tuitions. But our students, and I want to say they defy their demographics, they continue to make us very proud and are excellent achievers. On another note, uh, what this year was when we started, and I probably said this at a previous forum, I found it very difficult to open school this year. Every year we put the strategic plan up and we talk about what are we doing this year about instructional excellence as a district? What are we doing about safe and supportive schools? And what are we doing about family and community engagement? Those are our three big pillars of what we do as a school district. That is our strategic plan. And when we opened the doors in September and we greet the teachers in what we call convocation, we were minus 80 teachers. And when you have about 1,400 teachers and you have close to 18,000 students, we are not losing a lot of students. Now, I'll talk a little bit about students that have left the district. But for those students that leave, we have additional students that are coming in. 
And when you have 80 less teachers, when I opened school this year, one of the things we did was we put yellow ribbons around the auditorium and teachers came in and they were looking and I could see and I wanted them to look. I knew they weren't quite going to, and we put them all over the place in different sections of the auditorium. And when I started, I asked them to look to the left, to look to the right, and those seats that had the yellow ribbons, we had people sitting there the year before. And we weren't going to stop until we advocated for every dollar to make sure that we have our teachers in place. They are the backbone of what we do in this district. They are the teachers that every day are working with your students. When I talk about the three pillars, they are the ones that are delivering instructional excellence. They are the ones that are making sure that classroom is safe and supportive. And they're the ones that are working to engage you as a family. Now, when I say the word teachers, you have to understand that includes your administrators, that includes your school adjustment counselors, that includes your, your nurses. They are all part of our Brockton Education Association. So if I use the word teachers, I'm talking about everybody that make up our professional staff. So it was very difficult to begin the school year. One of the things I asked them to do, and I've continued to ask them to do, is to start each day when you feel like you want to complain about the lack of maybe materials and supplies, or the larger number than usual in your classroom. I've asked them to walk in and say to the principal every day, what can I do to help today? Can I do something extra? And by the same token, I've asked the principals to make sure with all the support they have, that they are going into classrooms, making sure the teachers have what they need, and if they need to, contact their executive directors, the office of the superintendent, the deputy superintendent, that we are available to make sure that we're supporting them in the best way that we can. I also want to talk to you when you talk about funding. We are a very large school district that relies very heavily on state funding. We have what's called a foundation budget formula. And the foundation formula has the state, and I'm just using numbers, I'm pretty close to what they are, 80% of our funding comes from the state. 20% comes from the city, and that's called meeting foundation. When you, and it's a very complicated formula, over the past couple of years, we have gone from budgets of uh, 16 million deficit last year, so when you have to reduce your budget by 16 million, it hits every part of the school district. And you've got to figure out a way if the system is broken. And I consider a $16 million deficit a system that is broken. So when you're working with the mayor, you're working with the city council, you're working with the school committee, you're working with all of our elected officials in the state house when you hear me talk about 80% of our money coming from the state. We presently consider this formula to be a broken formula. We have testified all over the state. We make sure that we have been at Foundation Budget Review Commission hearings to talk about the money that we need to support English language learners, the money that we need to support children living in poverty, children that have been living in hotel situations that are homeless, you know, children that have trauma in their lives and need additional emotional support along with our students that are our gifted students, our talented students, our students that are in our general education, our special education students. So we have done everything we can to talk about how do you fix a broken formula. So when we advocate with our legislators, there already is a report out there that says the formula is broken. And it talks about those very areas. It talks about the support for English language learners, special education, children living in poverty, children being supported with trauma. And what our legislature needs to do, and this has been on the governor's desk since Governor Baker came in in January of 2015. This report has been there. We are seeing this year a little bit of movement at the state legislature. They haven't finished their budget for the year. I probably won't know till mid-July. We are presently dealing with about a $9 million deficit. Now, that's a lot of money, but at least it's not a $16 million deficit that we were dealing with last year. And I am very hopeful about additional funding coming from the House of Representatives, 
and the Senate, they will finalize their state budget. Like I said, I'd probably know in the next couple of weeks. I have also, and I see when I mention uh, Councillor Wynne Farwell, we've met a few times with the city councilors, and we are looking to do everything we can as a city, but we do have to stay within our pocketbook because it isn't just our schools, and all of us, and I would say probably 95% of us here tonight live in Brockton and are probably taxpayers in Brockton. So you have to have and make sure you have public safety with a fire department and a police department and a DPW and all of the services that we put out there as a city. But I will tell you right now, one of the most important things, and those of you, again, that own homes or rent homes, when you come into a city, if you have children, one of the first things that you're asking about is the schools. You want to know that the schools are providing your youngster with the best services possible that they can provide. So when you talk about the, again, the um, quality of, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? The um, appraisal of our property, the value of our property. It matters when you buy the house and it matters when you sell the house as to what kind of a city and, you know, does the city care about their children? You know, are they willing to, you know, put the money and put the resources in the hands of our school department to make sure that we're not dealing with a $16 million deficit? or a $9 million deficit for that amount. So we continue to advocate. It has taken up a lot of our time. We are filing. You've heard us talk about it. Any of you that read the Globe back, I want to say it was the beginning of March, they did an excellent story on an equity and education lawsuit. And not only did that reporter spend probably about two hours with me interviewing and discussing some of the challenges, he didn't just take my word for it. He went and visited the very schools that I talked about. He went and visited North Middle School that started the school year with two of their classes with close to 44 kids in each of the class. One was a health class, the other one was a social studies class. We did have to bring an additional teacher on board and find ways to reduce that number. He went and did research up at the high school. He looked at the kinds of textbooks and materials. He looked at the uh, programs that we're using with technology. And when he wrote his story, he wrote it with passion. I'm sorry. Oh, I'm behind. The, okay, I'm sorry. No obstructed view. I apologize. He wrote it with passion. And I believe that that uh, reporter who continues to work with us is looking at what's happening with the recommendations. I started out by telling you about the Foundation Budget Review Commission looking at what the Senate and the House are doing. We continue to advocate in our own city in hopes that we are going to make a difference. So I, I've certainly started by talking to you about the wonderful things happening in the Brockton Public Schools. Um, to this day, although I do not have children anymore, I have a 32 and a 34 year old, I would send my children to the Brockton Public Schools. You know, to me, and again, as superintendent, I'm around every day as many times as I can for the good events, for dealing with the issues that are happening in the schools, out there with the principals, and again, I feel very strongly that this is a wonderful school district and a place that you should choose to send your children. So let me open it up to questions. You're here tonight, and I'm happy to continue to talk about certain topics that are interest to you. I also see um, our city councilor, Ward 4, Susan, I'm losing, I'm going to go with your maiden, this is terrible, in the Castro. Why, do you know what I was going to say? <laughs> so, uh, welcome. Uh, any other elected officials? Okay. All right, so let me open it up to questions. Um, you know, please give me your name and where you're from, and let me see if I can shed some light on some things that you have questions about. Okay, over here. Thanks, Jackie. Yeah. Have a teacher voice, but I Hello? Okay. Uh, my name is Casey Wilkinson. I'm um, a teacher here at South, but I'm also a parent in, um, of a Brockton public schools child. He goes to Hancock. My huge concern is class size. Um, in the K to two, class size is busting, and I'm really nervous in terms of the foundation for reading. You know, I've heard that the incoming, 
first grade into Hancock is going to be at 31. And I just, as a teacher, you know, and as a parent, I'm paranoid about that, but as a teacher, I'm just so nervous because I don't know how one person can get 31 kids reading on level and have that competitive edge because I see it in sixth grade when kids are suffering because they're not at sixth grade reading level and I think that foundation in K to two is so important and I'm just wondering about the priority in getting bodies, getting teachers into those classrooms so that you have at least, I know, in an ideal world, five teachers so that your class sizes are down because K to two is just that magical time when the reading happens because honestly by grade six, it's, I can't jump them three reading levels. It, it can't happen and so I'm so concerned in this budget that our kids aren't going to have that edge that they need to be successful. Okay, so Casey, I can't tell you because we have 11 elementary schools and there are some elementary schools where kindergarten grade one and two have class sizes of 22. And that happens to be with um, selection. There are some schools, whether it be transportation, neighborhoods, you know, Casey, you're talking a school at, like the Hancock, which is highly selected. Um, it's in the middle of a lot of single family homes, a lot of children. Um, I know Brookfield has large numbers. I think the Raymond School has large numbers. So we are dealing with larger than what we want class sizes. And it was interesting because I was talking to one of our staff members whose child is attending a kindergarten in another community, uh, a community that would be considered certainly wealthier than Brockton. And the child was going into a classroom that had about 22 kindergartners, and they made a decision to bring on an additional teacher, so the numbers were more like 18 in the kindergarten classes, and every one of those kindergarten classes had a para, which at one time, we had a large grant throughout the district that in every one of our kindergarten classes, which were probably a little more reasonable than they are right now, probably about 24 youngsters, and a power in the classroom. We no longer have a power in each of those classrooms. We're sharing powers among uh, usually the kindergarten grade levels. But I can't tell you what those numbers are. But as I said, we're looking very carefully. Right now we have 100 teachers that have so-called pink slips. So pink slips mean reduction in force. That is not where we're going to end up this year. We do have to finish with our city budget and I said our state budget. We have a contractual obligation on May 15th to let teachers know at that point in time if we do not have the money in the budget to hire them for the next year to give them an opportunity if there's another job opening. So because of that, it's an inflated number because we're watching what's happening in the State House. I feel very good about some of the assurances coming in, but I don't have those assurances yet. So we will get our teachers back as quickly as possible. And one of the things we do is we look at the whole district. So we're certainly in tune to some of those larger than not class sizes. When I have visited your schools this year, one of the first things I do when I go into classes is I start counting heads. And we were just at the Hancock probably about two weeks ago, I want to say. And I was counting probably about 27, 28 in the first, second, you know, third grade classrooms there. So the numbers were certainly larger than we would like. Another question? She's going to the microphone. to come back to us in terms of an improvement of our situation. Yeah, well, and one more thing. Last well, can thing, I answer these two questions sure. first? Just don't forget the third right, one. Well, okay. we're going to all get a chance, so let all me. Right, thank you. So as far as the lawsuit goes, uh, the McDuffie case, uh, which did have the lead plaintiff, you've all heard the story, I think. The uh, young girl was a student, I think actually here at South Middle School at the time when the case ended up being settled, went on to the high school. Her father was on the school committee at the time. Her name was Jamie McDuffie. It is now Jamie uh, Malnamo. She is a teacher at the Kennedy School. And that suit actually started in 1980. I was a teacher in Brockton. It was called the Webby case at that time. The Webby youngster graduated and you needed to find another plaintiff 
Hence, Jamie McDuffie came on board. By the time it was settled, and I want you to think about that, from 1980 till 1993, yeah. you had changed plaintiffs, circumstances changed, but it was such a time in 1993 where a number of forces came together. You actually had a very strong state legislature that also was looking at the inadequacies of students educated in the town of Wellesley and students educated in a place like an urban center like Brockton. So as it made its way through the courts back then, the legislature was already bringing on what many of us know as ed reform. It was going to be MCAS testing coming in, expecting students to pass a high stakes test, expecting teachers to pass a teacher test before they became a teacher in the classroom. So these were things coming through the courts when the McDuffie case was settled. The case you're talking about in 2005 which again, I'd have to add the years, so you're talking 10, you know, 13 years beyond that, was the Hancock case. And what that was, again, was a plaintiff in Brockton, it was Julie Hancock, her dad, Mo Hancock, was a school committee member from Ward 1 at the time. She became the new plaintiff, and what the state court did, and it was Margaret Boxford out of the Supreme Judicial Court of Massachusetts, who held the case open, but felt the state was meeting the adequacy legal term. So the funds they were giving Brockton or other districts they felt were adequate, but they left the door open if you wanted to reopen the lawsuit. So you ask me what makes a difference now? I legally feel we are at a tipping point. When you are looking at an urban district and that I'm telling you that you have a foundation budget review commission that back in 2014 had hearings all over the state with parents, with teachers, with administrators, with people that cared about educating students. And what they found out was the formula is broken. It is written, the committee wrote a report out. It was written in, the report was written in the fall of 14. Governor Baker, if you know, came in, and I mentioned came in in January of 15. And those recommendations, and it was billions of dollars if you actually went forward with all of the recommendations. So I doubt we're a state that has billions of dollars to put into education, but what they can do is with some of the recommendations, there were things in there such as health care is too high. We can't keep up as a school district, and you all know if you're purchasing health care. The health insurance keeps going up. Inflation factors weren't keeping up with the cost of doing business. A school district has to buy technology, has to buy books has operational maintenance needs, all those things, the prices were going up. And it was very difficult to run a district with those things happening. So some of the recommendations were clearly in that first round were about supporting English language learners. It definitely addressed health insurance. I think the poverty rate was in there, a number of things. And the state has not acted. They're starting to act. They're starting to look at as they pass their yearly budgets, they're starting to implement some of those recommendations. So the lawsuit, the reason we're going forward is, and you mentioned it, Elizabeth, it's not quick enough. You know, when you talk about years, but it does send a message. It tells the state we're willing to work with them, we're willing to advocate for what we need for our students, but we presently can't sit back. So we are part of a large number of urban districts. We are working with Worcester, we're working with Chelsea, we're working with Revere, we're working with the Lawrences. You know, we're working with Fall River, with New Bedford, Taunton. These are your urban districts, uh, many of them that surround us here. So we're working together to start to identify a coalition because it isn't just one district that's gonna take this on. It's gonna be getting data about a lot of children in the state that are not getting that adequate, and that is a legal term, that adequate education that McDuffie case promised to all children in the Commonwealth. So we can't just hit it with one legal equity and education lawsuit. We're looking, and that's why you heard me start with the ad advocacy up at the State House with just implementing some of those recommendations. So I don't have an answer for how long it will take. The only thing I can tell you is we're, we're doing the best we can with our attorneys, with our counterparts, in trying to look at how we research, get data. This isn't just a slam dunk. You are going to have to go before the courts and prove that there has been harm done. 
Um, last spring, I heard you mention the possibility of a crop two and a half override. Mm -hmm. What's your current thinking on that? Oh, I, you know what? Again, I'm a taxpayer in Brockton, and this is not my decision. But you have to make some decisions, again, about what's important. And here's my fear. If we don't figure out as a community how we bring businesses in, I mean, you do need, it isn't just residential tax base. So our elected officials have to have the funds to be able to, again, provide city services for all of us. So we've got to look at bringing businesses in. We've got to look at, you know, Prop 2 and a half is there for a reason. If you feel that there is something, let me just give you a for instance. If in fact we have a high stakes test coming on board a year from right now where the students have to take the test with a computer, online, technology. There are some districts, not only do those children have technology in their hands when they're three years old. You know, they have it at home, they have it at their grandmother's house. They have all of these opportunities. They go into first grade and they have a one-to-one -one device that they take home with them. It's with them all the time. We in Brockton every year are cutting out of our technology budget to keep teachers in classrooms. A million, we've been doing million, at least a million dollars, sometimes two million dollars a year, every single year. So what happens is what we have left, we try to buy laptop carts. And we're trying to make sure that we're getting them in the hands of children starting in third grade. So in an elementary school, we probably have shared devices for some of the little children. And what we're trying to do in grades three, four, five, and so on, is make sure that they at least have an opportunity with that laptop cart so that they have that device in front of them as they're doing their lessons. Because next year, in 2019, you're going to have 10th graders, which are about 1,200 kids up at Brockton High School, that need to take that test as far as taking it you know, with the devices. So when you start to look at those kinds of inequities, those are things that would concern us, and the state should be concerned about that. You can't have it. It's, it's interesting. When MCAS first came down, I don't know how many of you remember, but Brockton really struggled. We absolutely struggled with doing well on that test. And what did Brockton do? And it was embarrassing at first. It felt like we were failures. But here's what we did. We applied for grants. We did after school programs where kids had additional time for academics, some fun things. Certainly we talk about the arts. We had summer programs. I worked in those summer programs where we had an elementary school with close to 1,000 kids, two elementary schools actually, the Pluff and the Angelo, which were brand new at the time. We had programs, you know, again, so the kids didn't have a loss of learning during the summer. We had them in classes for, you know, close to probably another 22 to 25 days. We had, again, up at the high school, we had additional tutoring, support with math classes, support for our students that are struggling learners. And we turned it around to the point that a large urban high school is written up in the New York Times, is a, a national model of schools, and I'm talking about Brockton High. And it goes back and forth between being a level one school, which the levels are changing. We have a whole new accountability system coming in. But back then, level one showed the most growth you could have. And those are the kind of scores that we had. So I'm worried about next year. I'm worried about what's going to happen with the 10th graders. And I think it is going to take us some time as a district to make sure that we're resourced so that they have a fighting chance with our high stakes testing and certainly getting their high school diploma. You asked about the Prop 2 and a half override. It's not my decision. That is a decision with the mayor, with the city council, and again, the need has to be there for what this money would be used for. Um, I don't know, Councillor, if you want to address that. You know, I have publicly said, if we can't afford, you know, certainly to resource the schools or our city services, you and I have certainly talked about business. We've talked about, you know, trying to support Things so that we do have a, a bigger tax base, um, but you know, presently there is not a big discussion about it. Any? Did you want to address it? I don't want to put either of you on the spot. Please put your hand up if you'd like to address any of the questions. I, I think the honest answer is that because people in this, a great many people in this city live paycheck to paycheck. I do not believe a Prop 2.5 override would be successful, and I'm also concerned that there is a general skepticism about how government 
and I apologize for turning my back to people, there's a general skepticism about how tax dollars are being spent. Uh, we've just had a bit of a brouhaha over applying $90,000 for a public relations position at the police department when, quite frankly, I think the money should go to the schools. Uh, I have not been happy about the fact that we have proceeded to fill positions, administrative and clerical positions, knowing full well that fiscal year 2019 would be very challenging. I think we should have frozen non-essential hires because I knew the superintendent was going to have a tough year. So if I sound a little passionate about the schools, my great-grandmother was the first woman elected in this city and she was on the school committee. I spent 10 years on the school committee. My children went through the Brockton Public Schools and I, I can say to you that we all are successful because of the Brockton Public Schools. But we do need economic development. I think we have to exhaust all other reasonable administrative controls over how we spend. And then at that point, I think we have to think long and hard about our options. And I, I would, not to interrupt your train of thought, but the young lady who said that the, the suit was not successful, I would argue it was successful. I actually think that really forced all of the, the parties together to say, this isn't right. People who live in Brockton should have the same equal opportunity to education as people in Wellesley or Whalen. So granted, it didn't come to a formal court decision, but to the extent that we forced people at the legislative level to make some tough decisions and provide additional funding, I, I think it was successful. Thank you. Another question? Bonsoir. Right here. OK. Et question, bon, c'est pas presque une question, c'est peut-être une suggestion. OK. okay. C'est en fonction de fonds pour nous entrer et pour activité, pour nous capables de gérer et moyens pour professeurs. Et ça que... OK. Uh, it's not a question. He has a, a suggestion, like uh, organize a concert, uh, pay the concert uh, fundraising to generate uh, money in the system. That's uh, what uh, he thinks uh, that uh, we should do to get uh, people more involved uh, and get uh, some money to, uh, to invest uh, in the school system. Um, one of the things that you can do is, I'm not sure what school your children go to, but as I mentioned, there are so many things going on at your schools, and I know you do quite a bit of fundraising. Uh, I hear about runs that you do or things that you do for teacher supplies, for kids to have field trips, some of those extra things, you know, as parents. But you are talking, you know, as a district, you know, we're pro we are millions of dollars that need to really come from a source that supports your schools, it has to come from the city from the state. It's not that parents can't fundraise. And I think parents are a critical part of advocating. You are voters. You are voters for a governor. You have a gubernatorial race coming up. If you're concerned about things happening in the state, then you voice that. You send a letter to Governor Baker. You tell him that your kids deserve you know, an equitable education. You tell that to your city councilors, to your school committee members, that again, are working with their hands tied behind their back right now. They hear you, they're on board. You know, I'm with them, probably your school committee, at least two and three nights a week. So they're doing everything that they can to advocate, but you do have the power of the voting booth. So, you know, you do have a gubernatorial election coming up. Make sure your uh, elected officials, your representatives, you've got a state senator, make sure that they are advocating the best that they can for your very large urban district and continue to support your schools as parents. It is very much appreciated. Another question? Hi, Superintendent. How are you? Good. How are you? You see me at a lot of meetings and everything. I do. It's great. Um, a few weeks ago, I got a letter in my daughter's backpack 
saying that she wasn't going to be at George School anymore. And it shocked me, because we're in May, and she's going to be going to the Raymond School. So I got on the phone and made lots of calls. I called the principal at Raymond. I called the principal at George. I called the special ed department. I was really, really shocked by that. And then I find out that George is becoming a global study school. Um, I thought that the French program was going to go to Baker, but I guess they, you guys had a meeting or something and decided to make yeah, all I'll, the languages. I'm just trying to understand. I'll, I'll let me address this. that. Okay. So back in 2012, actually it was before I came on as superintendent, the district took on what they called a district capacity project. And the idea was to bring the school committee together with the Brockton Education Association president and also management, which would be your superintendent. And they decided at the time, and this was with the approval of the school committee, that we would develop in the city, or try to, it was a project. We called it at the time an international school. One of the things that we value is the languages of our community. So some of the um, languages which the, with the largest number of, of speakers is our Cape Verdean or our Portuguese language. We have a uh, Haitian and that is our French language. And we have a Spanish language. So they developed already, when this project came on in 2012, we already had one dual language program that was very successful. It was housed first at the Our Known School when we opened up the George School, it moved there back in 2008 or 2009. So we actually have students that have been through 14 years, or the program has been in existence, for about 14 years, and it, people, it has been very successful. So you have English speakers with Spanish, natural Spanish speakers, each learning each other's language. It has helped with academics, it's been very successful to you know, and it's interesting, I had the opportunity to recently visit Portugal with a number of superintendents. And everybody there speaks English and Portuguese and probably two or three other languages. And I don't know how we as a, and I'm not just talking Brockton, we somehow have gotten that wrong. You know, that we are not teaching right from the beginning our kids to speak two and three languages. It's such a gift. So with the Spanish program, we finally finished up the project. We met with the school committee many, many times talking about the international school. And even with the bad budget, we really struggled. But two years ago, or I have to think back, I'm sorry, three years ago, because we presently have had two years of the UNIDOS program, which is presently at the Raymond. So we brought in our first class of kindergartners that are now first graders, so two years ago. We had the consulate come out, the Portuguese consulate. They were very excited that we were going to be developing the Portuguese track. Our goal that next year, which would have been last year, was to bring on the French dual language program. We could not do that with a $16 million deficit. I felt it was too much for the district to handle. And we also had a number of other programs moving around. I know it wasn't popular, but it was decisions that we had to make based on a budget and needs of the district and I struggle with these decisions. Last year it was moving children that are preschool or special needs from the Gilmore to the Barrett Russell. It was closing a school for the Goddard and moving them to the Huntington, an older school, but giving them more space with an elevator. And taking the Huntington kids and moving them to the Gilmore for use of the elementary school. Because of that, there were too many moving parts. We could not bring the French program on. This year we decided to close the loop our goal was uh, international uh, school, and at the time, because of the budget difficulties, we were looking to put it at the Baker. The Baker already has a strand of Haitian-speaking students in uh, sheltered English immersion classes. We have a Haitian counselor there. We have a number of supports for the Haitian-French language. And what we suddenly realized was the Baker was already going through a turnaround plan and we didn't feel that it would be successful. And we said to ourselves, at this point here, we keep talking about the Global Studies School. We worked with a couple of the consulates and made a decision that this would be the best time before anybody starts and gets attached to a school to bring the French program over to the George School. At the same time, we had the kindergartners and first graders already at the Raymond School in the Portuguese two-way program. So we are pulling the Band-Aid off. We're bringing everybody over to the George School, and we will phase out not your general education. These are general education classes. 
So our goal is to provide these opportunities with a, an international or global study school for all kids in the district that leads into the same opportunities for middle school. So you won't just stop when it becomes sixth grade. You'll have French, you'll have Portuguese, and you will have a Spanish, and it'll continue up at the high school. So I know, and I apologize for parents that are getting the messages late. It's not usually how we like to do planning. You know, we're making decisions last night with a $9 million deficit, and I'll address it, of what we're doing at our middle schools. You know, we've lost about 300 students to a charter that came into the city, um, I want to say, three years ago. So we are down about 300 students, although we continue to get additional students into the district. So we're not actually down 300, but we do have a number of seats that we had to actually adjust, and that's another move that we just made last night. My concern is the integrated programs, because my daughter... Special needs. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. She loves the George School. I mean, right. it's going to be hard for her to adjust to a new school, so how are you going to help these children, K through 2, at the rain and feel comfortable and adjust? Is it going to be like a meet and greet kind oh, of thing? Oh, absolutely. I, I, had to, I had to get through last evening. So last evening we did have a finance subcommittee and made a number of final decisions. I had presented it, I believe it was last Thursday night. They wanted to wait till Tuesday to kind of review the information a little bit more. So we are working with the principals. We're working, you know, with getting, you know, information out to the parents. Um, and we are moving, you're correct, a strand of uh, special needs youngsters over to the Raymond with the change of the UNIDOS program going to the George School. But I assure you the Raymond is a wonderful school. Principal Carol McGrath is excellent with the students. Um, and and it, again, it is a change. Now, the, my only concern is I feel like we're playing musical chairs a little bit. So will my daughter be staying at the Raymond to the fifth grade, or yes. are we, we're not going to be more shifts. No, and, and and that is the reason, as I said, for the shifts. We, I hope you understand why we held back last year. There was too much movement in the district, and it was and it was movement that had to be done. Um, and we felt strongly this year that we were better to go ahead. And as I said, it was interesting when we talked about the French program, and we thought we had a great place for it, not to stress the budget. You know, once we looked at it for those very reasons, we'd like to make sure the kids are settled. And now that is our plan. You know, it's not, that is our dual language with the three languages in one school. Other questions, please. Bonsoir. Si, physiquement, il est en train de l'école déjà, il est en kindergarten, pas vrai? Si il est en kindergarten, et puis qu'on y a un alcool fait pour faire ce que, qui j'en a fait pour l'autre, il est en programme français, parce qu'il est en train de l'entrée. If uh, her child is already in first grade, how come he can uh, participate uh, in the French program? Yes, but uh, he he's, already, he's already in the uh, first grade. Okay, uh, can I answer? So the program will be only for kindergartner. So the first year will be kindergarten, and then next year we're going to add another one. A first grade. So, si le commence in a first grade déjà, il n'y a pas de chance pour rentrer dans le programme là. If uh, she's already in first grade, she has uh, no chance uh, to be in the Amitié program. Okay? Mais elle va déjà rentrer? Well, she, uh, she said that she will not never uh, learn French. Maybe in high school, she can choose. Okay? But uh, we middle start school. in middle, middle school. Middle school. Okay? In middle school. So, sixth grade, la like, sixième année, la carte prend. Okay, but for now we're starting with a cake. Okay, yeah, she's uh, making a, a lot of uh, effort uh, to teach her French. Continue with that. So, just, just to explain to everybody else, because I probably wasn't very clear about it, when you start a program, when we started the UNIDOS program, the Portuguese two way language program, the first year we only had a kindergarten class you know, a gen ed class, um, an English speaking side, and a Portuguese speaking side. The next year we added first grade, next year we'll be adding second grade. So for the Amitié program, which is our uh, French uh, dual immersion program, we'll be adding kindergarten for this year. So in other words, if you've got a first grader, she, all, she would not, next year she'll be a second grader. So eventually, 
We will have opportunities. Like we said, we have 14 years with the Spanish two-way program. So we now have every grade level. And it is difficult to come in. Uh, one of the things we're trying to do also, and some of you that have been in the Spanish two-way program, when it becomes third grade, if your child is testing for the gifted program, <laughs> I'm, not that that's unfortunate, if your child is selected, you leave the school. And it's very difficult to fill those classrooms with people coming in in third and fourth grade. So what we're going to do is at our new global study school have a TAG program right there. So once you choose the AMATA program, the UNTOS program, and the UNIDOS program, you will stay there for those five years. So there will be a TAG program on site for those students, talented and gifted. Thank you. Questions? Um, my question is, um, well, I'm Barbara. I'm the Spanish-speaking family advocate for the district, plus I'm a parent. Um, with the changes that are coming to North, which I know were decided last night, <laughs> how is that going to better classroom size? Because my children, my twin girls, were actually part of those students that were in a classroom of 44 students. And I know sixth grade's not coming in, but then these children are gonna go to some of our other schools. How are we going to try to manage the class size so that doesn't happen regardless of where they're going to. So uh, I'm going to answer this, you know, very honestly. We have lost a number of seats at the middle school. And when the funding is at a 16 or a $9 million deficit, you have to make up those funds the best that you can. So we tried to make the best of a situation. When we were looking at, and I wasn't sure if it was going to be close to uh, a 13 or $14 million deficit, I'm going to tell you right now, my recommendation to the school committee, and this is not popular at all, and I can't tell you that I lay home or you know, at night when I'm thinking of all the things going on, that this makes me feel good. But this has been what we've dealt with for the past five years. It just continues to get worse. This year it actually got a little better, but I'm still talking a $9 million deficit. Something had to be done. My first recommendation was we have to close a middle school. We cannot have seven middle schools. I made a recommendation to the school committee to close the Ashfield, to outright close 6th, 7th, and 8th, to relocate those youngsters to what we call the Compass Schools. So the Compass Schools are your middle schools. They have auditoriums, they have large cafeterias, they have fields for the kids. They were built as junior high middle schools, and they can hold the most number of students. Did I not like the Ashfield School? I thought it was wonderful. It's smack in the middle of a neighborhood, a lot of families, you know, people like that kind of an environment. It's a great place when you go and visit there. So this is not about looking at a school, feeling that it's a failing school. It's not that at all. It's making decisions that economically make sense for us. So for us, that would have been $2.1 million off of the deficit, and we would have spread the students out to the rest of our middle schools. When the money started to come in and it looked a little better for us, the other decisions on the table, and again, I don't want you to think that I think these are popular or wonderful. I looked at the Davis School, which has a K-8 to population. I go there, we have about 300 middle schoolers, the parents love it, they do wonderful things with the kids, but I have space at the Compass School South Middle School, which I am not going to close, we need the space. We were going to move the students from the Davis. That was another recommendation. That was about $500,000 that would have come off the deficit. It allows us to consolidate teachers. When you mention the class sizes, the class sizes are still going to be, in other words, probably close to 27, 28 to 30 kids. Hopefully not the 44 that we're talking about that we had to address at North at the beginning last year. That has not happened at this point. So the recommendation last night, and this is something that I actually feel good about. So when you have to make a decision based on a $9 million deficit, 
if we were to phase out the programs at North Middle School, which is one of our compass schools, we would not allow the sixth graders right now to choose to go to North. So the present sixth graders will stay at North and become seventh graders next year. The present seventh graders will become eighth graders at North next year. We feel very good about an opportunity with the Mass School Building Assistance Funds. And Brockton qualifies for 80% reimbursement when you renovate or build a school. When we built the Plouffe, the Angelo, the Arnone, the Baker, and the George, we got back some of them, I think it was 90 cents on the dollar, back when we had a forced kind of desegregation plan. Now we qualify for about 80 cents on the dollar. So our goal is to file a statement of interest in the fall. That's when it comes up. Our statement of interest will be to put North up, not only for a renovation, there's also opportunity for your middle schools to build an additional wing on, a STEM wing. That's something, again, that the city is going to have to decide. You know, do they bond the money? Do they put up the money? And the one good thing, and the city knows this, the councilor's sitting here. I see Council President Ionieri just walked in. One of the things, again, that they know is um, when you have, you know, opportunities like this to file a statement of interest, to build a new school, and we spent about 800000 on a facility master plan. So our city has looked at 22 schools. They've looked at, I think, the fire stations. They've looked at the police department. A company called Arrow Street came in for the past two years and finally have a plan for us. So this gives the elected officials an opportunity to decide do we want to qualify to build in a desperately needed 60-year-old North Middle School an opportunity to renovate, to update, the possibility of doing the fields for the neighborhood to enjoy? So we're turning something that is very difficult to do. You heard me say it's about $500,000 for each year because we will phase the school out to the point that when the present sixth graders become eighth graders and leave, then we would uh, go into a renovation period. Hopefully we have a few more steps. So I can't answer, I think we do qualify. I believe we would be chosen, meaning you know the Brockton Public Schools, to start to renovate. And really we can't stop there. Once you start to renovate North Middle School, and if you have a beautiful state-of-the-art you know, school, what do you think is gonna happen to West, which is a 60-year-old school? What are parents gonna wanna do? They're going to want that renovated. You know, what's going to happen to poor East? They're going to want East renovated. And I'm talking over a period of time, but this is the time to start to make that happen when we're struggling as it is, and hopefully this becomes something wonderful for our kids down the line. And you know what? Let me tell you a quick story that I'm probably going to tell the council next Wednesday night when I go before them. When I became the director of community schools, I had the opportunity to sit with a fellow named Harry Allen. I'm not sure who remembers Harry Allen, but he was very a Brocktonian from way back. He was the first director of community school, and here's the story he told me. When they built Brockton High, and remember, back in the 60s, those of you that are baby boomers, every high school around could not accommodate the kids that were coming through, the baby boomers, that generation. And they all had to build schools. Brockton had double sessions, and to give you a little history lesson, it is the present Keith Center on Warren Ave that actually had another building, what, the A building and B building? So I think one of the buildings is left, the B building. At the time, you were on double sessions. So some of the kids went to school in the morning, I believe the juniors and seniors, and the younger students went to school in the afternoon. No way to educate kids. But what your forefathers did, your elected officials, and they were a blue-collar community, they chose to spend $16.3 million on that high school. And that was a lot of money back then. And the way they sold it to the community was that the doors would never close. That's where community schools came in. People took courses at night. People used the beautiful uh, swimming pool up there. People used all the, t and back then technology was very different. It was probably a typewriting course. I think I took it at night. So there were many, many things that people did in the community to keep that school open 
and the community loved it. And I'm here to tell you that almost 50 years later, you have probably graduated over 50,000 plus students from that high school. But you know what? The time is right now to start to come up with a plan of what you're going to do with that high school. I want you to look around you. East Bridgewater, new high school. West Bridgewater, new high school. Middleborough building. Fall River building a new Durfee high school. Holbrook building a high school. Stoughton building a high school. I can't think of a place, Abington, you know, uh, uh, I think they did a, a debt exclusion or an override. They are looking and they're making sure that they're resourcing their schools so kids have schools that belong in the 21st century, that are filled with technology, that are filled with the jobs of the future, STEM opportunities. And Brockton is going to have to start to do the same. So to answer your question about North, I know it's a small move. And honestly, it's been made right now as far as phasing it out because there is some money that would come back as far as the deficit goes. But at the same time, we're really excited to try to move forward and start to take a look at some of our schools that are in need of uh, repairs, renovation, and possible additions to them. And again, this is, you know, desperate times call for desperate measures. We're not looking to put 40 students in a class. So we are looking, and we're stretching the limits. I mean, we definitely are. So we're looking to make sure. Um, you heard uh, Casey talk about, you know, certainly our kindergartners, first, second graders learning to read. Um, but, you know, this is something we're dealing with, you know, throughout the district. We are dealing with, and there are some class sizes that are very reasonable, and there are others that are being stretched. How are you? Good, Jenny. How are you? I'm all right. So my name's Jenny. Sorry. Um, I had a question um, about uh, if the courts could do anything about our mayor's irresponsible spending of the taxpayer dollar. And if not the courts, how can we as Brocktonians do something about how our mayor is spending our money? And the, I'm talking like besides voting him out. You know, I'm just, I'm want to like pick your brain about that because it seems like even though it's only 20% coming from the city that's still a lot of money and from judging by the past how things are being spent it seems like that money could have went to the schools well I'll answer your questions in a couple of ways you do have power in the voting booth and you have to you know do what you need to do you should be talking to your elected officials I will tell you that I have been working with Maya Carpenter and we, again, are working together and trying to come up with any funds that are possibly available. So I'm not pleased about our budget, but I understand, and one of the things we've found that really is hurting us, and I am going to discuss it, is when students leave our district, so, so please hear me out and try to understand some of this. If a student or a family chooses to go to West Bridgewater, and they do have what's called school choice in West Bridgewater, what happens with our money for that is every student that we let the state know we have on October 1st counts for about $12,000. I'm rounding it off. It's a blended rate. And what happens with that rate is it takes into account how many English language learners we have in our district, how many students have SPED, how many students have low income, all of that the rate that the state gives to a student from Easton is probably very different than $12,000. And I'm saying this for a reason. If a young person or a family chooses to go to Avon, which has school choice, or East Bridgewater, or they choose to come to Brockton, we allow school choice at our high school level. What we get from the district that's sending the student is $5,000, so out of 12,000, if a student goes to West Bridgewater, they only get 5,000, we keep 7,000, and that's fair. 
because that's a blended rate. When you leave to go to a charter, and I can't fault Mayor Carpenter for this, so hear me out on this. When you choose to go to a charter school, they get that whole $12,000, lock, stock, and barrel. The student leaves, $12,000 leave, and yet they don't leave a whole first grade of kids from the Hancock School, so I can say, oh good, don't need a teacher at the Hancock School there. They leave a few from here, a few from here, a few from here, and we still have to run a school district. So the mechanism, this year when we lifted our heads, we lost a large sum of money. We're in the third year of a charter being placed right here in our city. And I'm not talking about what they actually provide. I certainly don't know. I know what we provide here. But my point is, it is unfair funding. We lost millions of dollars, probably close to $10 million. So that funding formula, when you hear me talk about the formula being broken, the charter formula is completely broken. You know, if you have a gen ed kid that comes to you and it's not the English language learner, it's not the special education student, it's not the child living in poverty, then it's probably about a $7,500 amount when you look at all of the costs as to what that child should cost. So those are some of the things that, you know, the city is struggling and doing the best that they can. Um, I can't tell you I'm not completely frustrated, but I continue to want to work with our elected officials. I'd rather work collaboratively, not finger point, and come up with a way that we can solve this together. And I honestly, I know this sounds crazy, but I'm feeling better about where we're headed. I feel like our advocacy is working. I feel like we will eventually push forward an, education, uh, an equity in education lawsuit that might not even make it through because the state does the right thing. I feel good about our city looking at, and when you use the term economic development, you know, in our city, attracting businesses to come in. So I think we're honestly headed in the right direction. It is gonna take time. I know you're gonna tell me your kids don't have time and we're doing everything we can for that. So, you know, I, I'm not gonna get into a political, you know, discussion, but that's the best answer I can have for that, Jenny. Too, so I might not need this. Um, what if, you know, and I really don't know about the laws regarding this. Do you have children in the school? I do. I have, I have twins. One actually got a scholarship to BC High, so I had to let him Very take nice. it. Yep. But uh, my daughter's in all honors at the Brockton High, and I, I think she's getting just, if not better, in education. So I would like to say that. But what if, why can't the town get together or the parents have a petition, something that we can sign? Because I was at one of those school committee meetings where when we're losing all of these teachers, and I'm a public education teacher, and I know what we go through. I'm, I'm not Are fortunate to work in Brockton, no. I, won't, okay, that's I fine. won't say where, but, you know, and I know how hard we work. And there's no cuts to the town hall, there's no cuts to anybody in the city departments last year, none. And to me, there's non-essential employees getting hired, and it's no fault to anybody. I'm not, I'm not blaming, that's not what we're here for. But if we're gonna come together, we really have to look at how we're allocating the money because $50,000 is a lot to a school. And that could be somebody's, it probably is a lot more than that, somebody's employee, that's really not that necessary while we're in these situations. So, you know, I don't know if parents can come together, if there's enough people. I mean, I know petitions need a certain amount of, you know, signatures, but what is the amount we need? Just so that they can hear us. I mean, because I don't know that I know, because if you don't work in the education environment, it's really hard for people to understand the environment, their business. It's a, it's a separate entity, and I get that, but I do think that they could have, knowing what we were going through last year, you know, gave a little bit more. Just, you know, to get us, I, I don't know. And I just feel like, is there a way to, like, address that, or, or at least get, the parents voices and the taxpayers voices to them you know, parents again you know you have an opportunity to come together you know I, I'll tell you what I'm not on you know my 83 year old mother is on Facebook and tells me what all the grandchildren are doing she loves it I am not and again it's not because I don't know how to use technology I do but at this point as superintendent I need to stay so far away from it because I probably couldn't do my job every day 
everybody knows how to run the district. So when you say that, I hear you, but the power that you have, you communicate with each other on social media. You know, communicate for something that you feel is worth it. And when you communicate, you mention a petition. You know, lots of things start with a petition. Lots of things get on a ballot initiative. Lots of things happen in city government or town government because people actually have a voice. You know, when you talk about, I just was with friends from Easton, and they had a, a town meeting where, and, and correct me if I'm wrong, but I think the residents just show up and you're a town meeting member if you're, if you're a resident, is that correct? And you actually, they were voting, I think about putting the dispensaries, the pot dispensaries in Easton. And again, my friends went there and, and everybody has a voice. They stayed there till 1230 at night to make sure you know, that they voted the way they voted. But my reason for saying that is you have voices. So when you talk about a petition, get out there, bring it to your elected officials, do your research. Do, does, does Brock, I don't mean to interrupt, does Brockton's website, is there any co community, I don't know, I'm not familiar with the actual website, I go on that little app thing for the grades and stuff. You're but, talking about the Brockton Public Schools website. Well, yeah, something where parents can connect or a community, because I know that there's like a Brockton hub thing, but that seems very negative one time I went on it, so I didn't want to go back on that again. I have no comment. Yeah. <laughs> oh, oh, never mind. Um, um, I'm pointing to our communications director. So, Michelle, the question is, if parents want to communicate with each other, we have a Facebook page, but I don't think they communicate on that with each other. Right, but this parent is asking, can you Could I post you something? Right. Yeah, maybe we could get an approval or something ahead of time. Is that, you know, if we discuss, just, I, I think that having such a big city and such a diverse community, it's hard to get everybody together, but everybody cares. And if there was a way that we could just connect people, yeah. Right, well, I'm sure you have to be very careful with the, but I mean, even if it was just a signature, because I mean, they have those. Well, I mean, people, I mean, people are at those. supermarkets collecting signatures to get names on ballots. Yeah. People are at supermarkets But to everybody walks by them. You know, like you want to have it somewhere they can click. It's, you know, that, what is that dot org? I, I'm always, I'm, yeah, I'm probably the I'm last always one to changing ask. something on dot org, you know, so it's, if we could get something like that. But I, but I do hear, and I do think that you have a power within you. We had our Brockton Kids Count campaign probably three years ago when this all started. And you know, right away, it, it, it's too bad because I thought it was a wonderful way to bring parents together. We tried to have the schools encourage the kids. We had a week of what we called a blitz week at the time. Ending up, we had about a, th I don't know, I'm probably exaggerating, I thought it was about a thousand people on the football field, little kids, families. I think we had a DJ, we had face painting. Families came together and we talked about you know, our Brockton kids count. That was the, really the start of things pretty much going downhill with the struggles we were having with the state. And, you know, people, it's a shame because people then started to use it as, oh, you know, if Brockton kids count, why are you doing this in the school system? And if Brockton kids count, why? You know, and that's so negative. You know, you all need to, as parents, as community members, if it's something worthwhile to you, we can certainly be there as the schools, but I do think it has to come from the community. That's your grassroots effort, and that becomes, and it should be a group that meets, you research, we're happy to give you information. What if I started like a Facebook page? Could you guys, did, like, I don't know, put it out there so people could know that, hey, there's a, what I, I just, have, I don't want it to right. get negative. What I can have so. you do is work with our communications okay. director. There are some things that we yeah, really can't Yeah, I, I don't about, want people to start. But we can certainly work with you. I would like it to be but positive there is, only. there is power in your voices. Okay. Thank you. She's right behind you. Hi, um, my name is Ivelisse Caraballo and I'm new to the Brockton area um, and my daughter is in uh, Brockton High School. Uh, my aunt, I certainly did not come here to promote my organization, but like I said, I, I just came from Boston 
and we, I co-founded a parent-led organization that partners with educators, elected officials, clinicians, and other community organizations to try to help and support teachers in a collaborative manner to work with our elected officials and get policies that really w encourage um, you know, the, the policies to fund schools, to give them the support that they need for all of the things that you've mentioned. And so this is the reason why I'm mentioning this is because this is certainly something that we can do here in Brockton. And I'm happy to bring my ideas to anybody um, and have these community meetings. Again, it's in collaboration with the educators, so we would, I would need educators to, uh, to work with me. Before you leave, I'll have you speak to our communications director. Okay. okay. Questions? Is there something you'd like me to talk about then? Are there other things that you would like to hear about in the district that I can address for you? Well, I, I will tell you this. One of the things I'm very proud of is we started this uh, a few years ago when I actually felt that we are the largest employer. We have every day in front of us probably close to 18,000 students. So when you talk about being that large of an organization, I would expect that we would get word out to people about what the successes and challenges are. So I'm very proud, and we've unveiled it for three years, and I'm very proud of it this year. We have something called the State of the Schools Book. And this highlights every department in the district. It talks about the technology department, the bilingual department, the special education department, all of the arts, the music, the theater, Brockton High School. Every one of your schools has a page. So I see Miss O'Brien from the Gilmore School, formerly Huntington, holding up. It's kind of fresh off the press. And what we want to do with this is we want to get our word out there about what is happening in the schools. So I have proofread it over the past couple of weeks. And again, it is amazing, the one thing that I said to the communications director today as we finalized the copy, it is amazing what is going on in your schools. Is there anyone here from the Angelo School? So last night, they had, and it was called a Unity Concert, and at the time, we were in a four-hour meeting ourselves with school committee from 6 to 10, and I know uh, June Saber McGuire, our chief academic officer, said to me, I'm running out because I want to go see the Angelo performance. So I heard that there was not a seat to be had. You had to open up the balcony. So this is the support of parents. This is the support of community that actually got to see from kindergartners to fifth graders. I heard there were poems, there were songs, there were performances. So again, when you come together for something wonderful like that, I guess the kids were excited that they were on the Brockton High stage where the big kids are. So again, these are the things that I look forward to in, in our district, looking at the wonderful things that are certainly happening. And I started by talking about that. The other thing that I want you to know is this year, when the superintendent goes to a school, we bring a team of our administrators, people that I hold accountable from the person that is doing the finances, uh, Chief Budget Officer Aldo Petronio, to Deputy Superintendent Mike Thomas, who oversees how the schools are running, is the heating working, the ventilation, do we have the hydration stations for water, all of those issues. We bring our Chief Academic Officer, we bring our Communications Director, we bring our Chief Officer of Student Support Services, the Executive Officer of Human Resources, and the reason we do that is we sit with the principals and your team at the school. Not just to hear about how great things are, because everybody wants to tell you how wonderful things are. But the conversation has been rich because we're hearing about the challenges. And then we're visiting those classrooms and seeing every day what the teachers are dealing with. I have a group of educators over here when I first walked in. And educators I've known forever. And I looked at them and I started by saying to them, you know, it's going to be June 1st in a day or so. How did we ever get through this year? And what they said to me was, it is because of the people that we have there. And yes, it was a struggle. 
you know, people did the best they could because of the kids, because of the families, because every child only has one opportunity when they're a first grader or when they're a seventh grader or when they're a special needs youngster, you know, needing special attention. So it, it does make me feel good and I want to thank, I, I know, can I have the staff raise their hands? I see a lot of you here. You know, thank you for all you do. I don't know if you have anything to add because I know you're the ones in the classrooms every day dealing with some of the issues that we're dealing with. Just personally, I just wanted to say that I feel like my own bonds with my colleagues have strengthened and intensified this year. Because you're supporting each other. So it's interesting when uh, Elizabeth comes from the Ashfield School, and the Ashfield was one of my first visits during the first week of school after talking about that difficult opening. And when I went in, Principal Barbara Lovell had poster paper, just paper hanging up. And what she had were teachers, and there were so many names on there, of teachers that were volunteering to, I don't know, do the science club, plan the dances, help her out with the electives. Every teacher signed up for something additional to do in that school to support the principal and that was probably within the first two days of school that people signed up. So this is what went on all over the district. Um, you know, people have been wonderful, not just our teachers, our support staff. We had businesses that came forward with backpacks and pencils and, you know, goodies for the, the students. It's certainly not a way to run a district. That's not what I'm saying. But we are very, very thankful for the community support that we have. You know, I'm happy to stay here if people uh, would like to talk to me about individual situations. Um, I'm happy to address that. Are there any other comments or would anyone like to address anything? I'm sorry. So this has happened. Adrian, would you repeat that because now you've got the okay. microphone. So Could my main concern yourself? is my daughter's at the high school. When I drop her in the morning and go back home, and I live near the Gilmore, there have been not many occasions, but a couple where the crossing guard hasn't been there. Now I can say that he's typically faithfully there, but the week before last, I don't know what happened, but he was not there. I was coming down Main Street and I was getting ready to take a left onto Perkins and I stopped to let a parent cross the street. I could tell it was a Gilmore student, child had on his uniform, and a car went around the right side of me. Oh, yeah. This morning, yeah. again, he wasn't there. We just had that terrible accident there where the car went through the right. So I've seen it happen on several occasions. I've actually texted Miss O'Brien to say, you know, no crossing guards here. You know, I don't know who this should be addressed to because when someone calls out sick, it seems that that spot's not being filled. And I understand that if there's a light, there isn't a crossing guard, they put them maybe where there are no traffic lights, but at Maine and Perkins and South Street there, you need a crossing guard for sure. Okay, so, so again, you know, thank you for sharing that with us. First of all, you ask who should be informed. You know, please let your principal know right away and they will call the deputy superintendent. Well, at least let us know so that we can make sure the problem does. I can't address what happened or what didn't. Sorry, can you hear me now? They make strategic decisions about where they're going to move the crossing guards. So, of course, priorities would be where there are no traffic lights um, in order to increase the safety in the areas where there's just a stop sign. Um, but we absolutely recognize that we are short crossing guards and um, we're doing our best to try and fill those. Adrian, I appreciate every time you send me that message, I'm on the phone um, sharing out that information, but we have recognized that 
it's a problem. And I know at the Gilmore School, one of the ways that we're responding to that, um, we are looking at uh, staggering certain times. So the, the students that walk from the Gilmore, the further out posts that are closer, say, to South that aren't responsible for South students, but they're responsible for Gilmore, we're staggering their times so that by the time the students get there, the crossing guard is still there. And this posts closer to the Gilmore um, would obviously finish, start sooner and finish sooner, closer to dismissal. Um, so it's because of your input that we're able to make those decisions moving forward. So two things, if we're looking to hire, and we do have our custodial staff, but they can only go so far, and I know in the custodial contract, we're allowed to fill some of those positions that are not filled. So if people know, it's difficult because it's a certain time in the morning and then a certain time in the afternoon. So it's not something that somebody's gonna make a, a large living on, but it might be extra money for somebody that might have different work hours or people willing to be trained and to do that kind of work. Number two, it is really concerning driving around this city. So that needs to be a conversation with our, not only our school police to, patro to patrol a certain area, but also to let our police chief know if we have concerns, because I agree, you're taking a child, you know, you're trying to be gracious when you see somebody standing in a crosswalk. I am always fearful of stopping because that other car is gonna come around, really. You almost are like, oh my goodness, you know, should I stop and let the child cross or the adult cross? And then all of a sudden the car comes around. So people are driving much too fast and it, it really is concerning. So I will say something to not only Lieutenant Mills who oversees our police force to kind of position a couple of cars if there are people not paying attention to the children walking or coming home from school. And at the same time, if there are people out there that know people that are willing to work, you know, the morning or the afternoon when we have kids, you know, the times would be, you know, probably 6.30 to probably about 9 o'clock other times you'd cover all three uh, tiers, the um, high school, middle, and elementary. So I just want to point out very quickly is a couple of weeks ago, those traffic lights were out at Maine and Perkins. So what is the communication again with either DPW or city police because come Monday morning, there was no crossing guard there. So there was a day when those traffic lights were out. So again, how do you strategically place? But if the, if the school department doesn't know those lights are out, again, you think there are working lights, but there weren't. Yeah, no, so. we, if you have information, you know, please call the 7,000 number. We are open at eight o'clock. Other than that, you call the Brockton Police Department. Yeah. So they obviously are open 24 hours, but we do need to know those things. I just wanted to make a note on that. Um, my son has to cross North Montello Street, and it's crazy. I mean, they're, they're, they're rushing to get to a red light. Like, they see that within 0.1 miles, the light is going to be red, but they'll still go 40 miles an hour at this crosswalk. So I did call the police, and I spoke to the traffic guy, He's, he, has, he showed up there a few days just to let people notice. They did put like a yellow flashing light, but I've recommended that they change it to a red flashing light because people don't think yellow means anything. So I'm seeing if that gets anywhere, but if you call them, they were pretty, you know, they got back to me pretty quickly, especially if there's no light out, they have to send somebody. I mean, that's a safety for everything. Who's the traffic? Who oversees the traffic division? There, there's a guy that I... There's a, Captain Hallisey. And, and if a signal is out, yeah. it's a fire department signal division. You can call them, and they will send a truck out and address that. Okay. All right. Uh, anything else? I'm sorry. Over here. Jackie will be right here. One on paper hanger tonight. My teacher voice is not loud enough because I have allergies. Um, but I'm, I'm a teacher at the Barrett Russell School, um, and I also have a son that goes to the Hancock School in the first grade. Um, so I just had a comment to make. Um, our school was moved last year. It was the, uh, we used to be the Gilmore School, and we were moved to the Barrett Russell. And all of the staff and all the teachers, we were very apprehensive to make the move because we had number of children were, were uh, special needs preschool 
um, that were not going to be used to the school. We had to move our playground. We had to move our classrooms. We had to pack everything up. So in going forward, us as teachers were um, very loving and caring to the children coming in. Everything was new. And with the move, the best thing that happened was our principal, Joanne Camillo. <laughs> wow. I don't think Joanne is here. I'm sure she'd love that. No. <laughs> but um, she has lifted our spirits, made us feel so comfortable in a new environment. Our, she knows all of the children's names when they walk into the school. She visits the classrooms every single day. And I think that the move that we had last year that we thought was not going to be very good is actually one of the best things that we have had. Oh, thank you for saying that. So Mrs. McIntosh, who's also with us, came to the school committee meeting, I want to say back a month or two ago, uh, as part of our special education presentation. And I thought it took a lot of courage because it wasn't easy last year. And like I said, as superintendent, when you're out there listening to parents, and they, they, I understand, they're concerned about change, they're concerned about their children, they're concerned about communication, they're apprehensive about, especially children that don't do well sometimes with changes. So with all of that said, uh, when Mrs. McIntosh came to present about our special education needs, which is required under law to the school committee, uh, one of the things you said to them was you actually apologized. And you said, I was very fearful. Um, and you said the same thing. The principal every day greets the children. The staff has been excellent. They've come together as a community. And we took something that could have been very difficult and made it into a wonderful opportunity for the kids and the staff. So I thank all of you, whether you're a parent, a teacher, I will make sure Mrs. Camillo knows again. Um, I actually went there on Friday for the Special Olympics. It was fabulous. So you had uh, opportunities for, oh, my favorite was the water barrel. So one little girl, one student, and it was a warm day, she loved that water barrel. She had herself soaked, every teacher, you know, anybody in close proximity. But it was absolutely wonderful, the activities the kids were doing, and what a wonderful you know, community event. So you're all to be really applauded for such a, a great year at that school. Thank you. Um, you know, <clears throat> as I stand here and I introduced you to Principal Diane Lynch, I do see some other principals that have come in. Uh, Mary Beth O'Brien, again, was a principal that led the charge with our students leaving the Huntington, a school that had been there. I don't know how many years, when you probably know, Dennis Ioneri, you probably know, actually Susan, you, you go, how many years, 125 I think the parade is. So we moved them to the Gilmore School and I'll tell you we're, we're still stretched there. We wish we had even more classroom space at the Gilmore, but the kids love having a, a cafeteria, they love having a stage to perform, they love having fields that they're able to go out and have things that kids should have in an elementary school. So I want to thank you because I know that also was a difficult move and you really led the charge um, again for our Gilmore School students. So uh, again, um, you know, I thank all of you for coming this evening. I will stay around. I'm happy to address additional questions that you may have. Um, please uh, make sure that you support your schools, your teachers, you contact your elected officials and you communicate with us, and if there are ways that you can, we can communicate with you better, we'll continue to try. I know, Jenny, you suggested a number of things. Um, obviously, it worked because we have a lot of more people here tonight. Thank you for coming and, and giving us some good advice. You know, we try to do the Connect Ed messages. This year, we added the text messages for those of you that really don't like the phone calls, but you'd like to get the text message. So we'll continue to try to find ways that we can bring the community together. Okay, good evening.